<laughs> hey, good people. Welcome to Mommy Room Radio, a show created to help you moms design homes that you'll love and your kids will enjoy. Today, we're doing a live program featuring Dr. Jewel Diamond Taylor, and she's going to be talking about five emotional needs required for kids to flourish at home. So we're super excited about that. We're also excited about going live. We have a new division of Mommy Room Redo, and it's called for moms only. So this is some time for us to get together as moms and talk about how to make better homes for our kids. Is that okay? All right. So Dr. Jewel Diamond Taylor, you are a California-based speaker. You're an author. You're a life coach. You're a mother, a grandmother, a wife, and the founder of Women on the Grow. Thank you so much for being here. I know you as, yes, applause, applause. <laughs> I know you as a speaker from the African American Women on Tour Conference. Wow. That's where we first met, which was a very long time ago. Yes, it was. Yes, I remember you doing a speech. And if I'm not mistaken, during your speech, you started signing through the whole speech. Is that true? So you know mm -hmm. I know you. <laughs> yeah, I was so taken by that. And the audience was just so mesmerized by you kind of singing through sign language. Yeah, I still love doing that. Do you really? Yes. Yeah, so so tell us what's been going on in the last X, Y, Z years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been a long time since we shared the same space. Yes. Um, but I have still been on the speaking circuit, crisscrossing the globe, been able to speak in uh, South Africa, Norway, Brazil, Jamaica, the Bahamas, London, Cancun, Virgin Islands, uh, many government agencies. But on a personal level, I've been able to uh, overcome and work through the grief of losing my 38-year-old son to cancer. Wow. Uh, and then last year, celebrating 50 years of marriage. Wow. And then also having my first grandchild, which oh brought me right back into that atmosphere of what it is to be a nurturer. Uh, I love nurturing. That is so much a part of who I am. L I love being a mother and I love being a grandmother and I love what you are doing, Monique. Well, thank you so much. You know, I lost my mom, but before she passed away, she said, there is nothing better than being a grandma. She said, if you think you're in love when you have a child, wait until you have grandchildren. And she was right. I, I mean, I, I never knew that I could love the way I love this child. It's amazing to be able to live long enough to see your legacy and to have a chance to upgrade your skills as a mother because when you're young you're so focused on your career you're so focused on paying the bills you're so focused on getting them to school you're so focused on your relationship and a lot of times we're having children and we're in a relationship that's not happy so a lot of your energy goes towards just trying to keep that together and build a relationship and create a home and raise children and a lot of times things, you know, uh, happen and you're not quite as effective as you could be. But once you become a grandmother and uh, your, your temper has changed and matured and you have more free time and you have more wisdom because you look back and you realize, man, if somebody had told me that. Wow. Uh, and so now you get a chance to, I call it a second chance and I am loving every minute of it. Awesome. Well, congratulations to you. Congratulations to you. So I invited you today to talk about the five emotional needs required for kids to flourish at home. I have no idea what those needs are, <laughs> but I understand that you have some insight um, from all of your experience on what they are. And I had advertised it as being five emotional needs, but there are actually six 
So we I have, have a bonus, bonus point. point I, think. I have a bonus point that I learned from having my grandson. And I got to shout out his name. Everybody that knows me, whenever I do anything, I always say Cody. That's his name. Oh, hi, <laughs> but, Cody. Uh, welcome to the world. Yeah, welcome to the world. Yep. And, um, you know, my initial... Uh, college pursuit was to get a degree in psychology. I didn't complete getting my degree in psychology, but I've always been intrigued and continue to study behavior and continue to study child development. It's always fascinated me. And one of the things I learned are these points I'm going to share with your audience today, Monique. And the, should I go ahead with the first one? Absolutely. Okay. And it, they may seem so obvious, and we may be doing one of these points really well and the other one, we may not realize that we're slipping in that area. But the first one is children need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. They need to feel that someone is there to protect them. And I'm gonna tell you as a life coach to adult women, I cannot tell you how many times I have worked with women that felt that were, they were not protected by their mother or father. They were molested or they were raped or they were left unsupervised. Um, they were left with people that didn't have their best interest. I know people right now that are worried about their grandchildren because their children have addiction issues, they're unstable, and they worry about their grandchildren because they know their child, their grandchild is not safe. Wow. So that is so important that a child feels like you are there to protect me. That little child does not know how to say no. That little child is depending, is codependent on a parent to be present emotionally, to be present spiritually, and to be present physically. And a lot of times parents are working hard, or they're tired, or they're sick, um, or they've got some dysfunction from previous generations that have passed on, and they don't realize that their child is not safe. Okay. Now, did something happen with your audio? Okay. Okay. Did you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that making a child feel safe, that safe, you can come to me if you've got an issue. You, you're safe to come to me if you made a mistake. You're safe to come to me if you realize uh, that you're hanging around the wrong kids and, and they're luring you into some trouble and you just, you like, I'm afraid to say anything. Uh, children gonna, are going to make mistakes. They're going to fall short. And if they don't feel like they're safe enough to come and say, mom or dad, you know, this is going on, or I'm being tempted into sex, or I'm being tempted into doing drugs, or I'm being tempted to ditch school or whatever. That If the parent does not allow that child to feel safe enough, that child's going to make some poor choices. You know, I am so glad you said that. What often comes up for me, and I have a daughter now, so it really comes up for me. When I was a teen, my cousin's cousin passed away uh, as a result of an abortion. Mm. And no one knew she was pregnant. They didn't know who the guy was. And even to this day, I think about it and it breaks my heart. When I think about all the years that have gone by, all the things that we've done and everything. And she missed all of that simply because she couldn't communicate. Right. And didn't feel safe enough to tell someone what was going on with her. So that that's a great, is huge. That's a great example, Monique. I mean, when we say children, we mean uh, all the way from toddlers to just an adult child. Your adult child needs to feel safe enough because they need to know that as a parent, we've fallen short. And if we present ourselves as perfect, if we present ourselves with these tight halos, mm -hmm. our children are never going to come to us, you know, when they fall short. They're going to think, oh my God, I'm going to be judged. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be banned. Uh, I deal with so many people where their family has rejected them. They're not speaking to them. They've got secrets. So these issues that happen to a child uh, when they're a toddler or in school, it follows them into adulthood and then they become my clients. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, that mm -hmm. safe one really resonates because as a parent, sometimes we're strict and we try to have this image that we're so perfect, but right. I definitely let my kids know, yes, I have made some mistakes, <laughs> but I'm trying every day to do better. So wonderful. Yeah. It, this is such a, a pillar 
that parents need to build the house for their children. They've got to feel safe. They got to feel like somebody got me that I am that I have unconditional love. And, and it's tough sometimes if their parent doesn't even have unconditional love for themselves. Again, if they're strict, like you said, and I know a lot of people who have this uh, perfectionism uh, where they everything has to be perfect. In fact, I grew up in a home where we projected a certain image. Mm-hmm. And as we got older, cousins and people said, oh, I thought you guys were just so happy and all. Like, no, you don't understand what was going on behind closed closed doors it wasn't like it was horrific but it didn't feel we didn't feel the warmth we didn't feel uh safe to to make a mistake or to say say the wrong thing uh it was just such a strict atmosphere that you don't you feel suffocated so we want to make our children to feel free and not to the point that there's no structure but they do need to have some as they grow as they evolve they need to have more and more latitude uh, to feel like I can come to my parents with this particular issue. Yeah, absolutely. So it must be related that the the next piece is security. So that must be related to feeling safe. And that, and that's a little different. Um, Security means that as a child, I can't go and make money to buy food. I can't pay the mortgage. I need to feel like I'm going to have the things I need to survive. Uh, physically as well as emotionally. Do I feel secure that when that there's going to be food on the table? Do I feel secure uh, that I'm not, as I walk past homeless people, that I'm not going to be one of them? Do I feel secure uh, in my personality? I had two sons, so different, different in every way. And so emotional security, giving your child the security of knowing, okay, you know, I don't expect you to be like me or be like your daddy or, or be like, you know, your brother, your sister, that pressure makes a person shrink. They don't feel secure in their own personhood. So we have to provide emotional and physical security, letting that child know that, again, it relates to what you said. It relates to the safety, but it's more tangible. It is a sense of um, not only am I safe, but I'm secure. I have the things I need. See, safety means you're protecting me from harm, but security means I I feel like I have some I have a place to lay my head. I can I can open up the refrigerator and there's food. Uh, I, I can be different and still be secure and who I am without being judged. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but how do those people who aren't able to provide that, how do they make up for that or how does that work? So you might be a person where you are really living from pillow to post. How does that yeah. work for you? And well, your that's gonna lead us to the next point, which is stability. Okay. That's the next one. Uh, when a child has stability, and I'm not, it, there's nothing wrong with people moving. Uh, military families do it. Uh, sometimes the career uh, demands that you move. Sometimes there's divorce. Sometimes there's a change in income, but it's how you create the stability. If the stability is erratic and there's no conversation and there's no um, sense of uh, reasoning for it, if there's no way to create some type of a routine, then that instability will create some havoc in a child's mind. Um, you know, I, I come from an age where, you know, you were seen, but you were not heard. You don't talk, you don't ask questions. But I believe that children are smart. Children know when there's no love left in the relationship. Children know when mommy and daddy are having stress. Children know, they, they know. But so when we leave them out of certain opportunities to say, look, this is what's going on. You don't have to tell every detail, but let them feel in, uh, like you see them, like you're, they're included. Like, I got to give you some reasoning what's going on. You know, mommy and, and daddy are not friends right now. We're working through some stuff, but we love you and we may have to move. And if we move, guess what? I'm going to still be there. You know, I love you. Creating some stability is very, very important. And I think that sometimes when children don't have stability, it really wires them to be more resilient. Okay. So there's a good side and and a not so good side 
when a child doesn't have stability. Some children go from school to school to school. Uh, one of the ladies, one of the ladies in my ministry called Women on the Grow, I can't remember the number, but it was a crazy number. I mean, she said she must have moved around like 30 times. And she's very open about her, her story and her parents, uh, her father and her parents were on drugs. Her mother was bipolar, schizophrenic. Um, there was absolutely no stability in her family. Um, she's been with me over 20 years. And as she grew and as she studied with me and as she learned and did so many things with me, she was able to regain her sense of stability with her own children. But she was one of those people that says, okay, you know, my life was crazy as a child, um, but I decided I did not want to be a victim. And I reached out to get help where she said her siblings are still living in a victim mentality. Like, you know, why do they act like that? And poor me, they never took the path of saying, okay, yep, this happened. Yep, we had a crazy childhood. Yep, we moved 50 times, been to several different schools. But I, they, but this particular young lady was exposed to empowerment. She was exposed to books. There was something in her spirit that says, I don't want this anymore. And I want to understand it. And I don't want to transfer this to my children. So she mm -hmm. made an investment in herself. Uh, which is what some people need to do when there is a lack of stability. It's not the worst thing in the world. It is not a death sentence. It's all a matter of that person's mental capacity to be able to say, uh, I'm not going to be identified by that. I'm going to find a way to be resilient. There's some things that happen in a child's life that are just unavoidable. They'll lose a parent through death or divorce or you know, being deployed in the military. Stuff happens in our lives. Um, we, we don't come into this world wanting to be bad parents. We don't come into this world saying, I'm going to just mess up my child's mind. No, we don't do that. But stuff happens. And so, you know, programs like yours and programs like mine, the things that I do, we're offering a resource so that people can become whole again. They've been fragmented. They've been heartbroken. They've been uh, living with lies and living with secrets and living with dysfunction. This happens so let's not act like it doesn't happen. It happens. Children grow up in divorce homes. I, my parents divorced when I was seven years old, and I didn't realize until I was an adult how it affected me. But thank God, I was always uh, curious. I was always studying. I was always reading. I was very open to finding out how I could find Jewel and know who Jewel is separate from my parents' pain because I'm very empathetic. And at the same time, I'm very um, curious. I, I seek, I look. And so stability is something that will happen for a lot of children. I mean, look at what our children are going through today in this pandemic. There, yeah, you know, it's it's very sad, but then I don't allow myself to go to that dark place and say, oh, this is terrible. I say, you know what? Children have gone through slavery. Children have gone through Holocaust. Children yeah. have gone through poverty. Children have gone through floods and hurricanes and earthquakes and, and car accidents. And children, if um, properly, um, if they're exposed to the right people and resources, they can recover and they can be resilient. We are more resilient and smarter than we give ourselves credit for. But we have to decide, am I gonna lean towards being a victim or am I gonna lean towards being victorious? And, and you know, turning that testimony into uh, my my story of victory, not a story of pain. Yeah, you mentioned quite a few things that resonated. I am a product, well, I have had a divorce. I was going to say I'm a product of divorce, but no, my parents were married too. Death do mm -hmm. us part. But I, I did get a divorce. And so it's such a struggle because stability is not in your control when you're talking about two parents that live in mm -hmm. two separate households that have two different views of seeing the mm -hmm. world. And so that is something that really, really concerns me, that whole stability piece. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Monique, first of all, I think about the parent having guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. Remember I said children are very smart. Mm -hmm. Children love mommy and daddy. They love them. And energy is real. So if the parent is feeling a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, 
they're going to transfer that to the child. Okay. Uh, they can feel it. And what they will either do is take advantage of that and ask for everything they can get, <laughs> or you make that child become codependent. And I, I didn't even know I was going to say this, but uh, I'm remembering uh, during a rocky period of my marriage, my son who has now gone on to glory, um, he was the oldest and I'm the oldest of my three sisters. I remember laying in the bed, just feeling sorry for myself. You know, I'm not sure I'm gonna stay in this marriage. I'm, I'm feeling, having a pity party. And my son walked into the room and he said, mama, are you okay? And Monique, something snapped in me. And I said, oh my God, I do not want to transfer this onto him because that's how I was with my mother. I took on the role unconsciously of I'll be there for you. I'll be the rescuer. I'll be the adult. So I adulted very. I had a. I adulted very young, as a, as a child. I didn't really have a childhood. I stepped in. Nobody asked me to. But it's like, okay, I'm gonna be the strong one. I'll make sure things get done. I'll make sure everybody's happy. And so I saw it happening to my son, and something just like quickened in me. Like, oh my God. I am transferring this onto him. This is not his problem. It's not his responsibility to fix this. And so from that point on, I was more conscious of my energy and how I was acting. And it's not like I was going to act and fake like I'm okay, but I just was more aware of how powerful we are as parents and how powerful our energy is and how our children at a young age will take on a particular um archetype and they don't even know they're doing it one will become the clown make everybody laugh one will become the troublemaker one will become the smart one the pretty one the sick one the strong one the leader the healer and we take on these roles because in the home the child is picking up on the lack of stability the lack of security not feeling safe that makes sense yeah definitely definitely i can appreciate that yeah so let's talk about soothed. Ooh, <laughs> I am a natural soother. And to have the opportunity to hold my grandson and to calm him when he's crying, to be the one to say, that's what children do. Why is everybody upset? They cry. Let them cry. <laughs> or when he is having a little tantrum, when he doesn't get his way, it's not that you're spoiling, but you're acknowledging, oh, that's how you're feeling right now? What you do when you're not an informed, aware parent, you're like, be quiet. What's wrong with you? Shut up. And that's a parent who's already stressed. That's a parent who wants control. That's a parent that's tired. That's a parent that's agitated. That's a parent that's not aware. You're talking to a two, three, four-year-old that's crying and you are hollering at that child rather than saying, mommy's here, daddy's here. Um, how, let me hold you. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with soothing them because they learn very quickly that it's okay to cry. It's okay to have my emotions. And what happens, a child that is not soothed spiritually and emotionally by their mother, that child grows up to say, well, let me eat that cookie. Hmm. Well, let me just go to sleep. Nobody sees me. Well, let me have a drink. Let me have a cigarette. They're going to find a way to soothe themselves because no one was there for them to soothe and calm them. And our children, just like we as adults are under tremendous stress. And sometimes it's we as parents that are putting stress on the child. You better get the A's, you better uh, dress a certain way. Don't talk like that and uh, act like your sister or your brother or come on, let's go. And why did you say that? All of those things are putting pressure on a child and don't cry, little boys don't cry or little girls don't act like that. We put all this pressure so that when the child says, I gotta shut down who I really am because I don't feel secure here. I can't really show up as myself. Right. And that was me as a child. I couldn't show up authentically as I am because I wanted to be, I wanted to belong. I want to have security. I need food. I need shelter. I don't need to be kicked out of this house. So we shut down. And when you're not soothed, I was never soothed as a child. So I learned, then I am going to learn how to soothe other people because I know that feeling of not being comforted. I know it. 
And so what I did, I just said, let me be a comforter. Well, with some people, they will look for other ways to comfort themselves. Now, Monique, one way I did learn to comfort myself, and here's confession, is shopping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which a lot of women do. A lot yeah. of women. That was, that was how, is rather than have an argument with my husband, rather than deal with whatever was going on. And guess where, guess where I got that from, Monique? My mother. My mother was passive aggressive. I was passive aggressive. I never learned how to express my emotions because I never saw my mother do it. But my mother dressed. My mother shopped. And I grew up to do the same thing until I said, wait a minute, this has got to stop. You've got to start acknowledging your emotions, you got to start expressing. You cannot, because that's a temporary high, you know, just like drugs, it's a temporary high because you don't know how to soothe yourself when somebody cuts in front of you on the freeway or somebody cusses you out or love walks out the door or somebody says something mean to you. You don't know how to calm yourself. So we acted out. So it's important that as mothers, we learn um, to keep ourselves healthy so that we're available to soothe our children when they need it because it's it's so healing it's it's a it's a it's an honor it's it's a privilege it's a joy to be able to be there because that that phase of when they really need it is so it's such a small window wow. it's such a small window and so what happens if you're not soothing them they're going to find a gang a lot of our young men are in gangs because they didn't have a sense of security stability safety so it's like I, they're going to get it from someplace well i mean in our community though there's this thought that everything has to be a certain way you have to behave i remember being young and in church mm-hmm. i don't even remember what i did i guess i looked the wrong way didn't open the bible i don't know what i did but i mean when i got home i was in a heap of trouble about whatever it was that i did in church yes yes you about young kids and a long service uh-huh i'm <laughs> they hungry get bored. yeah they're hungry they get bored they're tired mm-hmm. of sitting there or whatever but I mean, I grew up at a time where kids absolutely had to behave under all circumstances. Other people can't see you get out of line because it's embarrassing. It's this. Right. And, and now- also that com- that also comes from in our culture, a sense of not only um, image, but protection. Like, you know, don't speak a certain way you know you need to have a certain tone of respect you need to be smart you need to you don't have eye contact you don't do certain things so that came from a sense of I got to protect my child with especially when they're not in my sight because as a culture our history is you know our children come up missing our men come up missing you know you can say the wrong thing and you're in jail uh so it's a mixture of you know image consciousness it's a mixture of a culture cultural protection and um, safety. It's a mixture of that own parent not feeling good about themselves. So my child is like my doll. This is my little doll. You see how well behaved my doll is? Look how well dressed my doll is. Oh, my doll says the right thing. So they're projecting their insecurity onto that child because that child is an extension and a representation of them. So that, so, you know, my sisters and I, we had to be dolls. We were dolls. Mm-hmm. We dressed a certain way. We act a certain way. You, we went to other people's homes, which was rare. But when we did, you do not say you're hungry. You do not ask for anything. You do not eat their food. You do. No, you don't say a thing. You sit on that couch and you don't say a word. So <laughs> you look back on those things and you realize, well, I'm, I'm glad I had some good upbringing, but you're not really prepared with healthy social skills. You're not you don't learn how to receive because you're told don't ask for anything. It, so that, know, it, that it, it's hilarious that you even say that because the first time that I met my mother-in-law, we walk in the house and she's like, you want something to eat? Okay. So they're West Indian. We're Southern. As uh-huh. a Southern family, you never ask for anything to eat at somebody's house. Like no. you never, you're never hungry. You may not have eaten for the last two days, but when you go to somebody's house, you're completely full. So I go to her house and she's offering food and I'm like, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. 
So finally, she says, do you think something's wrong with my food? <laughs> so it was just a difference of just culture and experience. And yes. Yeah. So that's and different. then you see how what happens to us as adults? We're not even in, we're not even aware that we're not even we're not even connected to our body sensations that we need something because it's right. been cut off. Right. You're sad, but you better not say anything. You're right. hungry, but you better not say anything. You're mad, but you better not say anything. You've right. been disrespected. You better not say anything. Right. So what happens is there's a great disconnect, a great dissonance in what we feel and what we exhibit. And it, and it, plays out into our adulthood. I remember I'm the oldest of three girls and because my parents were divorced, I was born in Washington, DC, but my mother moved us to California. So every summer we would fly back to DC to spend uh, the summer with our dad. Mm -hmm. And so here we are three little girls flying. And back in those days, you got full meals. You got a tray of full meal. And that was a long flight. And the stewardess would come and say, are you girls hungry? And my sisters would obediently look up to me. And if I said I wasn't hungry, my sister said, no, I'm not hungry. Now, I didn't even realize that until we became adults. I said, Jill, do you know that we used to want to eat? <laughs> we looked up to you. You're like, no, if she ain't hungry, I guess we're not hungry. <laughs> no, that's true. So, so that's what I meant by we have to make it safe and secure for children to learn how to, in a healthy way, express their emotions. Because if we don't, we shut it down and they grow up to be adults that don't even know. Like, I don't know, what do you think? I don't care, what do you think? They don't even know. There's such a disconnect. I heard a lady say that for a long time, she never really realized how she liked her eggs because she always looked to somebody else to say, I want scrambled. And she said, I want scrambled, <laughs> I want you know, hard boiled. And then she, she was like, I never even realized what I even liked because exactly. I was to someone else for guidance. So, yeah. So the next point is children need to be seen and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> everything, you know, everything in modulation, moderation, but what I mean by being seen is that not just being physically seen, but do you understand me? Do you really see my individuality? Do you see my gifts? Do you see my talents? Do you see my hurt? Do you see, um, uh, do you understand me? And, and Monique, I can't believe you're pulling all these things out of me because something just came up again for me. And I gotta take a deep breath because when my 38 year old son was coming to the end of his life and we were taking care of him at our home and he was very deep he's, he was he's just like me and he looked at me and he said mama do you un do, do you understand me do you do you get me and that was a deep question it was like yes son I, I see you I, I get you because my son walked to the beat of a different drum mm -hmm. my son was so deep and like I said both my sons were so different and I guess he just wanted to know before he left this earth that I see you. And I love that phrase because that's an African mindset. Instead of saying, I love you, they walk around and say, I see you. Wow. That means you see my soul. You see the God in me. And children, want they want to know that you see me beyond what clothes I have or what grades I get. Do you really see me? Do you see my value? Do you see what makes me different than my brother or my sister? And, and, and so when I have my grandchild, I laugh because, you know, when he discovers something new or he's on the slide or he's doing something, he'll be engaged and all of a sudden he'll turn around to check to see if I see him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I see you. Mm -hmm. So they're starting at a very young age, checking to see if the people that are important to them that give them security and stability, that give them identity, that give them culture. Does this person see me? I'm growing, I'm evolving. Now they don't have the language for that, but they, they have the sense of pride. Like, oh, look at what I'm doing. Look what I just painted. Oh, I just found yeah, this rock. Absolutely. Oh, look at me. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, they, they're feeling this sense of, of, of endorphins and, and 
they're feeling these feelings of oxytocin and they're feeling these feelings of dopamine. Something is chemically happening to them. And it's like, yes. And they want somebody to cheer for them and to see them as they grow. So children need to be seen. And what happens again, when, when mommy is tired, when mommy is stressed, when mommy is sad, when mommy is addicted, when mommy is angry, when mommy is busy working two or three jobs, she will not see her child and that child will look for somebody else. And so she may get pregnant early. Wow. Uh, he may uh, join a gang. Uh, they do all kind of, cause they gotta be seen. Does anybody see me? Does anybody see me? Wow. So that's what we, as, as, as mothers and creating a home, we're acknowledging that child, their accomplishments, their milestones. And, and, and we're connecting with them and that's what they crave. And if we do that well, then they have a less chance of gravitating towards circles that will really bring them harm because they give, us, give them a false sense of belonging and identity. And, that, and we are social creatures. We, we, we cannot survive without belonging. We need to belong. We need to be seen. We cannot thrive. This is why, you know, people have sororities and football teams and um, choirs and uh, any type of an organization where you feel like, yeah, I'm a member of that. Yeah, I belong to that. Yep, that's that's my identity. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's how we're wired. We need to feel that. So we need to give that to our children when they're young. Um, the last point is, and I got this again, from my grandson, whenever he's with me, if I'm sweeping the floor, he wants to sweep the floor. If I'm bringing groceries out of the car, he let me carry it, Grandma. Everything I'm doing, he wants to be a part of it. He wants to serve. And what we do as uh, young mothers, if we're not aware, but put that down. I got it. I can do it myself. Leave me alone. Go play. But that child is letting you know they want to know that they can serve. They want to know that they can contribute. They want to know that uh, I'm capable, even if they do drop the eggs, there's something in them that's waking up that says, I need to feel like I am not totally helpless. It is the beginning of them becoming independent. It is the beginning of a child learning how to serve other people. Because if a child never learns to help other people, to serve other people, to make a contribution, that child grows up very self-centered. It's all about me. Interesting. Yeah. So a child needs to know how to serve. You help me set the table, bring the groceries in, go get me that box, uh, bring me a glass of water. Not that you're turning that child into a servant or right. a bellhop, but you, you want to give them an opportunity to say, yeah, I did that. I remember uh, I had a relative visiting and it was difficult for them to come up the stairs in my house. And so we jokingly said, Cody, push, help them get up the stairs. <laughs> Honey, Cody pushed all the way up to the top of the stair. And when he got to the top of the stair, yes, <laughs> he just felt like, look what I did, you know? And so we give him as many opportunities as possible, even though he may make a mess. Yeah, you can do it. Yes, you can help. But that's the to- difference with the grandma because, you know, moms are upset and yeah, it, it's a reflection of your parenting that they messed up or they didn't. So that's and it's not thing. so much that you, it's not so much that you messed up or I messed up as a young mother. I, I was never taught these things. So that's why your program is so powerful. We need help as parents. We need somebody to tell us like it is, you know, this glow of being pregnant, what comes after that glow? A lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of building communication skills, a lot of patience, a lot of love, a lot of prayer, because Bring an individual to this world is one of the hardest, most difficult, most sacred, most beautiful things we could ever do. But nobody helps us. And, but they'll point out what we're doing wrong. We sure will. <laughs> but, call somebody you know, else and this, exactly. And this is why the village and the family and the tribe is so important because we need to be around our elders. I'm grateful that I'm allowed to have time with my grandson because I know that his parents are busy. I know that they're, you know, striving and trying to make things happen. And so they're gonna miss, they're gonna miss certain things. I ain't mad at them because I can identify with that. But this is why multi-generational families being together and, and, 
in close proximity or at least living near each other is so important to the development of the child. The child needs the wisdom of the elders. I mean, now that I'm an elder, now that I just celebrated my 70th birthday, I'm like, okay, I get it now. Oh, okay. I'm going to stand in this power because I know some stuff that I didn't know years ago. And I, I'm excited about sharing it with others. So when you asked me to be a part of this, I was like, yes, God, it's, it's, this is where I am now in my life. I, I need to be pouring out. I got more days behind me than I do in front of me. And it's important that I share and shorten that, you know, shorten that curve of mothers, you know, having regrets and having shame and having guilt. So, so we went through the six emotional needs required for kids to flourish at home. Just talk about some things that you would do differently. Like you're saying, when you look back (laughs) from where you are now, I'm talking about as a mom, just talk about some things that you would do differently if, if you could. Well, I'm on (laughs) the, girl, you're going to have me crying because I, 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 there's so much I would have done differently. And I've had to work through my own guilt and work through my own shame and work through my own regrets. It's like, I didn't know. I just didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, One of those things is teaching my children the importance of finances, Uh, teaching my children, um, you know, having sons. I grew up in a house full of girls, so I didn't know what it was like having a house. I was the minority, my husband and my two sons. Um, I didn't understand the need to raise sons to, um, well, I'll give you an example. One time I saw my husband giving my my son some money and I said, why are you giving him money? He said, no man should walk out the house with some money in his pocket because if they don't, if they don't have money in his pocket, he'll find a way to get some money and it'll probably be illegal. You know, things like that. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have not, I, I, jokingly, but it's not funny. Mm -hmm. I've always identified myself as a smother. I didn't realize how I was overprotective, how I, there were instances where they needed to experience some consequences. And I was like, superwoman, Mm -mm. no, no, no. I should have allowed them in certain situations, go ahead and and deal with the consequences of some of your choices. I, I didn't want them to have pain. I didn't want them to suffer, which is so unrealistic. We all are going to have to deal with pain. We're all going to have to deal with hurt, betrayal. We're all going to have to deal with not being seen by other people, not being loved by other people, not being respected, not getting the job, not getting the contract, not getting on a team. So I um, wanted to protect them from the pain of the world. And that is so unrealistic. We have to know how to teach them how to armor up, how to have a relationship with God. I have to, you have to teach them how to trust themselves, not trust you. And I used to always say jokingly in my, you know, when I'd be at a podium, I'd say, oh, my sons think I'm the ATM, not the MOM. Well, guess why? Because I was acting like an ATM. Wow. So I had to learn, don't always be so available. Don't always be so uh, the, 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 the rescuer. And so what I did, what we tend to do is we want to be the opposite of what we saw in our homes. So the opposite of what I saw in my home is what I gave to my sons. And there's some things I wish I had done a little differently, but I didn't know better. I said, oh, we're not doing that in my house. And then I do the exact opposite. And both extremes are not healthy. Some kind of way we have to learn how to modulate and realize that we can't just go to the extreme. And, and I use that example when, when I'm working with women that have been in abusive situations mm-hmm. and they want to kick themselves like, oh my God, I was so passive. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't find my voice. I didn't talk back. I didn't say nothing. And as soon as they get free, they go to the exact opposite. Now they are brash and they're loud and they, they're talking to everybody like, you can't say you know, the, they got that neck roll with everybody. It's like, wait a minute, tone that down. Right, right. Dial it back. Right. This is not him. This right. is a whole different situation. So we tend to go to the extremes of we either want to copy what we saw in our childhood or we want to do the exact opposite. So, um, yeah, I would say that I would definitely 
have been more diligent about teaching them about finances. I would have been more diligent in um, just helping them to become independent of us and to say, now you're on your own. And it took us a while, we finally did it, but you know, I, I just love loving all my sons. I just wanted them with me all the time. Right. And, and they, they left the nest a little later than most of my peers. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got, and see, I tell speakers all the time, I learn every time I get a download from the Holy Spirit and I'm giving a message, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that was for me. <laughs> so I, I'm like, oh God, you told me to tell, but oh, wait a minute, that was for me. So I learned when I started really seeing how the messages that I was teaching applied to me and how I was getting convicted, like Jewel, you need to stop that. So the example is uh, when I finally realized it was time to launch, you, you guys got to go, you grow, you got to go. Um, and I said to myself, why would anybody want to leave if you're making up their bed, you're washing their clothes, it's through the refrigerator, mm -hmm. uh, they've got security, mm -hmm. <laughs> they've got stability, they, they're safe. Why mm -hmm. would they ever strike out on their own? You, you, it's like living at the Marriott. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I made it too comfortable, too safe, too secure. So I stopped cooking, I stopped doing things because as I said, my nature, I'm a nurturer. I love, I love mothering. I love giving. I love serving. Mm -hmm. But you can do that to the extreme that it's unhealthy. And so I started backing up mm -hmm. and I stopped doing things and it made them, you know, it made, it's like the eagle. The eagle has to start dismantling the nest. First, she takes off the feathers and then the mm -hmm. little bird comes back and then she takes off the leaves until eventually uh, that little bird starts filling the thorns of the nest and they fly. Well, I had to start dismantling the nest and made them uncomfortable. And girl, it didn't take them long to find their own place. Wow. They found their own place. But I was, you know, I think as parents, as mothers, we need to know, are we handicapping our children? Are we clipping their wings? Are we holding so tight because we're not getting along with their dad or because we're lonely or because we just love nurturing and now it's gotten unhealthy or because we don't want to be by ourselves or because we want to be able to say, oh yeah, me and my son or me and my daughter, we hang out. That's not healthy when they never get a chance to uh, be independent of you. There's four different types of relationships. And when a child is like a Cody, he's dependent upon us to give him food, to give him shelter, to keep him safe. Uh, at some point, they learn to be interdependent. It's like, okay, it's like a dance. I do for you, you do for me. Then they learn how to be independent. I can pay my own bills. I can take care of myself. I can fix my own problems. I can have my own relationship with God. But then we have codependency. When you or the child is dependent on the other to, feel, feel, to fulfill something that is missing in their lives. And I see that a lot with mothers that are my peers that they have a codependent relationship. Either they're paying their children's bills or their children are paying their bills mm -hmm. and they don't realize how unhealthy that is. Uh, it's like, you gotta call me every day. I mean, right now my son is working out of town. My son mm -hmm. is 42. And uh, I have to just keep telling myself, Jewel, don't call him. <laughs> wait till he calls you wait till he calls you and I'm, t I'm telling you this is the difficult because I I want to hear from him every day and it's like that's not healthy there's, there's no need there's nothing wrong with you Jewel I'm good it's not mm -hmm. I don't have any emergencies going on I just want to hear from my son mm -hmm. but I have to let him be independent mm -hmm. wow well how wonderful was this conversation thank you so much this was a pleasure and I, I'm just so glad that we had this opportunity to chat well, Monique, I, I mean, look at the divine order because I had no idea that you were first aware of me, what, 20 years ago when I was with right. African-American women on tour. And so my, I salute Maria Dowd, who yeah. allowed me to have that role for 12 years. And not a week goes by that I don't connect with somebody that knew, knew me from that experience. Really? 
Yeah. Yeah, was, that was a wonderful conference. It really was. It really was. And congratulations on your show. Congratulations on your growth and your passion and your purpose. I am so honored that you allow me to be a part of this. Uh, and I pray that the mothers that listen to this uh, will follow you and will um, help you to grow and reach more audiences and expand your territory because this is so needed. Well, I had no idea I was going to share the things I shared with you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, what's going on with you? What, what can we expect next from you? Well, um, because of the pandemic, I've had to pivot. Uh, I have not been able to do any traveling. I, I, I was used to traveling, you know, three or four times a month. I was speaking everywhere, conferences everywhere. And then I have my own women's ministry called Women on the Grow. Mm -hmm. And I was hosting my own retreats and doing all kinds of things with them. So, and at, during those busy days, I was also life coaching, but I wasn't doing it as much as I'm doing it now. And so more and more people are seeing the value of having life coaching and counseling. More and more people are getting used to the Zoom. Mm -hmm. More and more people are having time to say, you know what? I refuse to have the stigma or shame because I'm asking for help. People are realizing the benefit of having someone like myself to help them to bring some clarity, to empower them, to encourage them, to be an accountability partner. So uh, every day I have clients now. Uh, wow. I used to have an office space, but that overhead was not necessary because most of my clients are out of state. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they're getting used to using the Zoom. So I do live counseling and coaching. And I am invited to a few conferences uh, that are now pivoting and they said, okay, well, we can't do the physical thing. We'll still have conferences online. So one of the organizations that I was a speaker for was the FDIC. I've done all the government agencies wow. you can think. Wow. So the FDIC is coming up with a conference and I'll be their keynote speaker. Um, I'm just looking forward to having my retreats again. And uh, every Sunday for the past six months, I offer a webinar every Sunday. I call it the filling station. It's three o'clock Pacific time, six o'clock Eastern time. And the filling station is um, in memory of my grandfather in Mississippi. He had a filling station. They didn't, they didn't call them gas stations then. They were called filling stations. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? I want to, in honor of his memory, I remember walking down dirt roads in Vicksburg, Mississippi and carrying him a bag lunch to the filling station. And then he'd open up the big Coke machine and my reward was pulling out a grape or orange crush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so my thing is that through this pandemic or just through life, people are living and walking around in fumes. They're on empty uh, and they need to get filled back up with hope, filled back up with faith, filled back up with information and inspiration to keep them moving forward and not being stranded on the road, uh, getting that premium fuel that I offer through my webinar that I do every Sunday. Wow. It's been amazing. Wow. Uh, women all across the country attend, uh, but mostly it's the women that are part of my tribe called the Women on the Grow. That is my 501c3 uh, outreach nonprofit organization. And what we do is we offer uh, coaching, books, materials, resources, money, prayers uh, for women that are going through adversity, such as single parents, breast cancer, divorce, depression, trauma, homelessness. Uh, grief is a big part of it because since I've had that experience of losing both my parents and my son, uh, I'm very much aware of this process of, of grief. So I do a lot of grief um, counseling. So in terms of our audience, would they connect with you or is that something available for people not in your group or? Oh, absolutely. It's open okay. to everybody. Yeah, okay. it's open. Okay. yeah. Yeah. It's open to everyone. And they would either go to my email address, which is jewel motivates at gmail.com and request the link and the password. Okay. Um, there is a, a nominal fee or they can go to my website, jeweldiamondtaylor.com or womenonthegrow.org. Or there's another option. They can text me. 
Okay. And that number is 310-526-2552. They can text me and say, Jewel, I would like to get life coaching. I would like counseling. I'd like to get your books. I'd like to be a part of your webinar experiences. And that text number again is 310-526-2552. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate you and we hope you'll come back. Absolutely, Monique. I'm at your service. This was really wonderful. I don't get to talk about these mom hacks that often. So <laughs> it was really great experience. Thank you so much. And God bless you and your family. All right. And God bless you as well. And we look forward to having you back soon. Amen. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>